Brent Harris, thank you for being here. Yes, thanks yeah. for having me. How about taking a few minutes and tell us something about yourself and why you're running for office? Yeah, so uh, as, as you know, I started the tool library a number of years ago, and it really was a thrust of, um, of looking around our neighborhood in the South End and seeing an issue that we didn't see any, anybody proposing solutions to that we thought were, were good or credible in some ways. We just, we saw, you know, a lot of uh, delays around housing initiatives. We saw a lot of, um, just a lot of rundown housing and boarded up housing. And so, you know, for me, uh, as somebody who is invested into the community and trying to figure out ways that we could make the community better, um, and for somebody who's worked in community development, um, so had a, having studied uh, community development at U of T, worked in my master's there, and uh, really had an understanding that it's very difficult to solve systemic poverty until you can address some of those uh, realities in with housing and in neighborhoods. So creating safe and stable housing mm-hmm. is one of the most important issues. Yeah, save some of those thoughts for the question. Sure. To you. Yeah. Is that, why, why politics? Well, I just got frustrated. I, you know, we we kept working hard on on that issue, trying to empower neighbors. And so, from just the social enterprise perspective of the Two Library, which kind of marries business with nonprofit kind of engagement. Uh, I started digging into the legislation around housing and very much found a home among the Green Party. Felt welcome there. I went and got involved with the policy team. So I wasn't planning on getting involved politically, just I'll go work on some policy with you, sounds good. And I went to the first policy convention and they accepted three of my proposed policies around uh, farm farming incubators. So, you know, trying to empower the next generation of farmers in this province and, and very much came out of my involvement with food security issues in St. John. But then also housing, there was real reception there to what would a good, healthy, provincial mixed housing policy look like? And then the third one being around education. So when I, when I went there and that happened, I felt very welcome. And then they bugged me enough and, and I started the process to become a candidate early in 2020, thinking, oh, we've got a year at least. Uh, so I slowly worked through that process and, and became vetted as a candidate. And then August happened. And, and we just were off to the races. So, so what's a campaign day like for you in this unprecedented COVID environment? Holy crow! So for me, I start the day at seven. I'm out the door by seven. Um, before that, um, I don't often get to see my kids before I leave because they sleep until about seven thirty, four to eight. And uh, very much had to have you know the support of my wife, my wife, my partner Cassie, to be able to take this on because I knew it would mean that that was I was going to be absent for at least three, four weeks. And, but then I go, I get some meetings in before I go to work. I get to my job site, get my, my crew going. Cause the two library has a little construction enterprise within the enterprise. So I go there and I'll either swing a hammer for seven hours, six, seven hours myself, or I'll make sure that the crew is ready and good to go and don't need me. And then I'll try my best to get meetings, get to neighborhoods, you know, go meet with community uh, centers or, or just individuals within the riding. Um, so it's a 14 hour day every day. I'd like to talk a bit about voter turnout. Sure. The turnout rate has declined generally over the years from yeah. over 82% in 1967 to yeah. a little over 66% two years ago. Right. The turnout rate is notoriously low in St. John yeah. and in St. John Harbor in particular. Mm. It's the lowest voter turnout rate of any of the 49 constituencies. Mm-hmm. Do you have any explanation for this? Uh, well, how can you turn that rate around? You know, I, I think my grandfather said it best. And it just kind of, it's a, it's a saying that captures the disenchantment with the political process. He would say, it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. And I just said, you know, for a long time, I was a young liberal and I'd be in my university days. And I got disenchanted because I saw that there was a very small core of people really controlling the debate and the discussions. And those people who either they'd be experts or just grassroots individuals trying to bring improvement um, didn't get listened to very often. And if they did, they were very much politicized and patronizing kind of passing comments toward the real issue. And, and so I, I checked out. I said, this is not a place where change can happen. Um, and I think what needs, what can happen, how we can turn that around is by empowering our third parties. It's hard because it's not equal playing field, right? Our third parties 
by far have the best ideas. Like our two main political parties, in my opinion, I know this is partisan, but it, they're bankrupt for really good ideas and inspiration, but they have a lot of monetary potential and they have a lot of financial capacity. So they can bring the, the political machine to bear, but people like me, who I'm 31 years old, and I've been politically active you know, since I was in my teen, and I got disenchanted because there was no room for me, my voice didn't matter, and I can see, I look around in, you know, with my neighbors and who I, I had in the South End and other people in the city that I kind of talk to, they feel the same way. It's a, again, who do you, who does Mary go for? But it's because those third parties just have so little potential and so little machinery and so little funding to bring to bear on a, on a campaign to bring those ideas to the forefront. Like, look at the CBC reporting. They're saying this is a two-way race in St. John Harbor between the PCs and the, and the liberal. That's historically true. 150 years, they've passed power back and forth. But for somebody who's like, no, I, I really believe in these ideas, how do you feel as a voter? You feel like, well, I better not, I better pick the devil I know, or I better pick what I know, or, or whatever. There's no inspiration or impetus to be involved politically. And I think if we can see more of a third party voice, I know for me, when I saw green MLAs on the floor, um, it was like, okay, wait a minute maybe we can, you know, do something here and bring some, some movement and some change. And I think that's where we start, right, is obviously proportional representation would go a long way at giving voice to those people who are not included in those two main parties. But it's a symptom, right? As we see voter turnout go down, I think it can be absolutely connected to this symptom of the political system just being so polarized and so focused on very, very similar demographics. We canvassed a number of community organizations working in the constituency and asked people to send us questions. And I have several here based on the themes that we received. And the first one deals with poverty, not surprisingly. Right. Poverty rates have been persistently high in the constituency. Minimum wage rates are low and mm -hmm. tied to inflation. Uh, social assistance rates are low. Uh, millions of dollars has been spent by the province in St. John since the election in 2015. Yeah. What do we have to do to get the rate down? Housing. I, I, I can't say this enough. I know I'm the guy who works on housing. And, but it, how, do you, how do you stabilize a community? How do you convince that somebody should invest in their community, take a risk on their community, or stay in their community and volunteer if they run, or go outside their door and they see busted windows, busted doors, and board up housing? Everyone I've talked to in our community centers has said to me, one of the big issues with, because they'll get clients, they'll get people who they're working with, they're trying to, you know, go from point A to B to C to kind of address some of these root problems of poverty, then the person will move because they found cheaper housing somewhere else or they get renovated. evicted. That's a common phrase we throw around, just means a, a landlord will terminate the tenancy. They don't have to give a reason, do a little repair or, or paint the place and then up the rent to $300 a month. Now that happened a lot in the South End after the Irving headquarters was built. And I ran into myself, I had my tenancy terminated. We had to find housing in a hurry um, and, and so it's one of those things that I don't think we can solve some of the systemic poverty until we solve housing. Because if you feel dignified about where you live, and if you feel like you have a safe home to go to, then some of those like initial primal ex instincts to go and hoard what you can and, you know, try to survive, some of that stabilizes and you begin to say, well, I want to get involved with that community center, or I want to go to that program, or I really should get that job and try for it. But if we keep people in this unsafe, unsettled situation around housing, and we don't introduce good legislation to reform it, I think we could throw millions more at it and still not move the needle. COVID was unanticipated, <clears throat> but it certainly has made its impact. And right. what it did is it magnified issues that vulnerable populations are are faced with, I think, food security, mm -hmm. isolation, mental health issues, uh, precariously employed constituents talk about the absence of paid sick days as a major concern. Right. Uh, the opening of schools worries many parents. Yeah. Uh, what's your plan or your party's plan to ensure that these issues highlighted by COVID are addressed? Yeah, it's, it's identified a number of gaps, and there's no question about that. Um, as we dig into the green platform, I think a, 
guaranteed basic income can go a long way at stabilizing some of this concern. We saw it, right? The government acted and they said, well, we need people to feel stable enough during COVID that they'll stay away from work and they'll stay home. This is something we need to do to keep COVID-19 and the spread to a manageable level for our health services. And, and so we introduced a temporary guaranteed basic income. And we've been crying. The Greens, again, the Green Party is a global party. It's, its roots are in Europe. It started in the 70s as an eco-friendly, eco-centric alternative. And, and it's grown from there. But we share these same value sets. And on that front, you know, when we talk about decentralizing services so they're accessible, uh, whether that be healthcare services, so we see issues like Clinic 554 not be the exception to the rule, but to be the more normal reality where somebody in Charlotte County, for example, doesn't have to get a bus and two taxis to get to a clinic where it's the only place they can receive the services they need. Um, but of course, as COVID happened, all of those gaps became more, more pronounced. And so I think now for the first time, we've had a reality check to say, you know, all these systems that we've created, all these centralized, efficient, we call them systems, they're very fragile. Certainly from a food sovereignty perspective, it was kind of eye-opening for me to walk down a grocery store aisle and see shelves empty on whole aisles. And why was that? Well, because people were cooking more. And it's not that, you know, the supply chains were so fragile that we were starving, but you saw firsthand that had this gotten more intense, had the had COVID-19 become more intense internationally, or had it high, maybe had it had potentially a higher death rate than it did, which is very possible um, in the future. This way of doing business, this way of doing healthcare is fragile. And so as we decentralize our economy, as we decentralize our health services, I, and the Green Party certainly gets this, and the guaranteed basic income is a stab at that. There's also a number of policies around food sovereignty. There's a number of policies around, around health care mm. that are taking aim and mm. trying to decentralize I'm ask about health care because it rose itself as an issue amongst constituents. I mean, right. New Brunswick has the second highest rate of disability in the country. Yeah. Uh, constituents raise concerns about mental health and addictions, about wait times, access to family physicians. Mm. What would you do to improve the healthcare system generally and in the constituency in particular? Right. So uh, this is where I'm kind of a guilty by association advocate for midwifery services. But I don't see it. It's not just the sense of midwifery care per se. But it's a it's a it's one of these watershed issues where we have all the raw data we need to know about midwifery care, having the opportunity to spread out that kind of care and keep more women out of the hospital system, maybe more in a clinic setting, or even in some cases, like in Ontario, home births are very common, midwives come to the home, that, that creates relief for our healthcare services, and it's very effective, and it saves a lot of money. Except we've like drug our feet as a government, we've you know said we'll do midwifery, sure, it's legal now in New Brunswick to do midwifery care, as it always should have been, but it's only in Fredericton, right? And there's only three midwives. And there, it's not just, again, it's not midwifery, but that is one of these pieces where it's like, okay, well, what about mental health services? Well, right now, there are a lot of people who don't want to go to the regional hospital to get mental health services. It's mm -hmm. crowded, it's busy, it's not, not inviting. And you talk about De Dr. Edgar at the Clinic 554, here's a man who creates uh, an entire environment that people want to go to get those healthcare services and they'll travel very far to do it. Sure, they could get them in, some of them in St. John, sure they could get some of them in Moncton, but they go there because there's support and they feel not like someone who needs a 15 minute doctor relationship. They actually can have a conversation. <laughs> and I think how we get there is by proper taxing of our industry to pay for that. Because right now we rely on the federal government for health transfers to fund this behemoth of a health service that we have except it's not working. And, and I think, you know, as we look at the regional hospital paying either an equivalent amount or more property tax for its area than our refinery, it's staggering. And you think that is not right. And like, what would our province be if we just fairly taxed heavy industry and, and these uh, other commercial 
things that are exempted or just given these huge breaks. Completely. So, you know, that decentralized healthcare service, you know, it can hit a number of things, mental health, access to abortion, access to midwifery care. And all of those are, have a really strong return on investment. Yes, they're front end loaded. So whoever the government is gonna be has to bravely and courageously take it on and say, yeah, we know it's gonna cost us a lot this first four years to do it. But we know over 20, it'll give us the resilience and the strength we need to solve these problems. I don't see anybody else saying that. Um, as a matter of fact, it's the opposite with, with Blaine saying, hey, if you don't think this is fair, take me to court. And uh, with Mr. Higgs, and I just, that is such an unhelpful stance to take when there are so many people who are asking for help. So, yeah. Two months ago in July, there were 89 people in St. John actively experiencing homelessness. Mm. Men, women, young, old, across all genders and ages. Yeah. Uh, concerns were raised about systems and how sometimes jails or hospitals would actually discharge people into the state of homelessness. Or yeah. um, what does the province need to do to end homelessness? We need housing reform. <laughs> it's going to come back to housing because, it, I mean, it really, it really, we have a hunt, we have um, people on two year wait lists to get access to affordable housing. And then if you talk to people at Outflow or Coverdale, people who are in domestic um, abuse situations and need emergency housing, there's nothing. It is very difficult. And even as we create relationships with landlords and there's work done, I don't see any, I mean, having worked on a building and rallied 40 volunteers to try to salvage 96 Victoria in the North End, and people showed up, contractors wanted to give their time, and we went to the Minister of Labor who's in our writing, Trevor Holder, we went to Dorothy Shepherd, we went to everybody we could who was in government, and we asked, said, we, all we need is this amount of money, we can make this building safe. And then our partners, so One Change Inc., Land Bank, and us, will work on securing the other funding to develop this. It was a $300,000 price tag, so we needed initial movement from the government to make that building safe, and what happened? We got delays, we got move to someone, with, oh, you gotta go talk to this person, you gotta arrange a meeting with that person, we didn't make it happen. The building set for seven months until it finally caught fire and burned down. And we had people who put in easily $20,000 worth of work on the building already to make it salvageable, to gut it, to get everything out of there, put everything in dumpsters, clean it up. But we just didn't have the funding to make the build. So there's a perfect example of an opportunity missed with a ton of community support. and. To me, if, if you're an MLA and you're in government and you see 40 people showing up on a weekend for free to work on your work on housing, that really is the jurisdiction of the province. How do you not show up and say, what do we have to do to make this work? Because this is amazing. Like that's the kind of synergy that we need to tackle some of these rundown houses, right? So uh, it's homelessness is in that same vein, right? Where we don't have enough stable housing for them, even as they progress to certain systems, and certain other uh, organizations, whether it be Outflow, whether it be Coverdale, Salvation Army, or these other groups that deal with frontline um, homelessness, I just don't see a way forward until we reform who gets funding, what community groups can get access to, and how we build housing, and how much subsidized housing we put in what neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's gonna happen. Here's a question to put to all the hybrid candidates. Uh, do you support the proposal to build a new school in South End? Oh my gosh, yes. It's it, it's so number. I went to the meetings, right? The the, the neighborhood um, action meetings. And at the first of the meeting, it was one of those things where you know, well, we we got this school problem, and I think we're going to have to close them down. And blah, blah, blah. and normally that people would have been outraged if you go into a neighborhood and you tell parents with kids who go to the school around the corner, and that's the only school they can access easily and what and you tell them you're gonna have to close the school down normally it is just not a comfortable place and whoever has to make the announcement knows they're just going to be have a hard night except they got a standing ovation and it was like why because everybody knew everybody felt it you got these schools that really are in disrepair and need to be completely uh not tore down but they need time you need a couple of years to go after major renovations on um, on the school in the South End, and and the other ones too are maxed, and we haven't had schools we, in Anglophone District in South. It's been over the past thirty years we've had the fewest amount of new infrastructure built, 
and you look around in the South Bend and you say, this community needs a new piece of infrastructure because it will help development, it will attract investment, it will fix some of the problems, and the kids who go to this school will feel dignified. It could change their trajectory completely. The narrative they're telling themselves as they go to this school will be different and more positive. So I just don't know how you can make a case against it and how it hasn't been announced yet is staggering. With as much, unfortunately it's all too common in St. John for us to have all this cry for help and to get delays or cancellations uh, like museum or transit funding. Uh, but you know, it just, again, it needs to happen. It needs to get better. And we need, we need politicians to just say, okay, this is not a political football. We're just gonna do it. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's not what's happened. Any other issues you'd like to touch on or final comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm, very, I'm very excited um, for what is happening in Harbor right now. And I think for the first time, we see, I know on my own team, I see a lot of young people. And I have been involved with other candidates and I haven't seen that kind of energy. But I think as we go through COVID, as we see these ideas that are gonna help us recover stronger, and then we hear from our city council, you know, we balance the budget, but we need prevent the province to come and meet us halfway on some of these issues. Um, for the first time ever in my experience in St. John, there are a number of different pieces of the puzzle, all working together towards some of these common ends. And, um, you know, that momentum is just, uh, it's inspiring. And, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of positive that can come out of this, but at the same time, it, I, I do believe it comes back to housing for us city specifically, and I think it comes back to a guaranteed basic income uh, to stabilize this poverty issue, to stabilize our housing, so that we because there's there's investment happening in town, and there's energy for development. But if we marry that to the poverty issue instead of making them two silos, there's a lot of potential there. So yeah, I think that's all I would. Yeah. Right, Harris. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks so much, Randy. It's okay. great.